you follow. Uh, why do you say that empiricism is the least definitive and most conjectural form of knowledge? Aren't chemistry, physics, and biology empirical sciences? How are these sciences conjectural? Um, very good question. Really good question. Um, empirical knowledge, which is what I see, what I hear, what I taste, what I touch, what I smell, you know, it's got to go beyond the senses. If it goes beyond the senses, then it can be real knowledge, like medical knowledge, chemistry and physics. But when we reduce knowledge just to empiricism, and we say that there will be no metaphysical intrusions in this, in other words, you will not be able to use pure reason and tell me that the world is actually created from nothing. No, I will not allow that. I will call that a metaphysical intrusion. It's not metaphysical, it is pure reason just telling you what you saw. Okay? So when you reduce empiricism to the only source of knowledge, then it becomes very weak indeed. And today we have, uh, in the wake of modernity, we have post-modernity, you have post-modernism. And postmodernism, in many ways, is the most honest statement about people who only accept empirical knowledge as their source. No revelation, no pure reason. Okay, because my eyes, my ears, my tongue, my hand, my, my nose, they cannot tell me the meaning of anything. They cannot tell me that there is design. They cannot tell me that there is purpose. They cannot tell me that this is beautiful and that is ugly. You know, we say today was a beautiful day. The sun was shining, the weather was nice. Okay? My eyes didn't tell me that. My ears didn't tell me that. You know, my heart told me that. It took this information and it interpreted it. And it said this is beautiful. Okay? Um, if the sand were blowing, you know, and the sky were covered with darkness, and I go outside and I get sand in my eyes. Can I say that's ugly? On the basis of empirical knowledge, if that's all you've got, you can't make that decision. That's just reporting something else. In order to say that the day when there's nothing but sand and wind and cold, that that's an ugly day, that's not from your eyes, that's not from your ears, that's not from your touch or taste or smell. That's from something else. It's from your heart, it is from what you want, your need, and for the postmodernist, that's purely relative. Okay, so don't tell me this is true, don't tell me that's false. Um, the postmodernist is not right, they are wrong, but they are honest in that. If we do not have pure reason, and if we do not have revelation, and if we cannot listen to the heart, and if the heart is not part of, you know, the um, judgments that we make, you know, then we have to say that everything is relative. You just like it, I don't like it. Okay? So, uh, empiricism is not able to tell us the most basic thing. Empirical knowledge only becomes valuable when we can use reason in conjunction with it and the heart and revelation. And this is really important. I mean, today, for example, we have big crisis in knowledge. Big crisis in knowledge. We have a civilization that produces more information than human beings have ever imagined. And we have specialists in every single field, in physics, in chemistry, in law even. And the more specialized people become, the more ignorant they become. This is the reality. And our fields of science don't even speak to each other. Sociology does not speak the language of anthropology. Anthropology speaks different languages. And they don't even communicate with each other. Sociology speaks different languages and they don't communicate with anthropology. Sociology and anthropology don't speak to economics. They all have different languages. This is all because of specialization, 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 and there's no 
cross fertilization. Okay, and this is also part of the curse of this totally empirical, relativistic approach in modernity and post-modernity. And our civilization is totally different from that because we are the people who in the first, second, third, and fourth centuries of Islam rooted knowledge. We rooted knowledge. We took all the knowledge of the ancient world, world of India, of China, paper we took from China and we made it inexpensive. Mathematics we took from the Greeks and from the Persians, from the rabbis, from the Hindus. You know, we took all of this together and we synthesized it. And even when we talked about numbers, we said numbers are not just quantities, they are qualities. Now that's mathematics. That one is not a quantity only, it's also a quality. And that's, that geometric figures are not just combinations of angles, they are also personalities. And the square has stability. And the circle has this. And the triangle has that. This is why you get these beautiful mosques, like the Mosque of Sinan, you know, in Mecca, and in, in, in Turkey. The most, I mean, you have beautiful mosques in Cairo. We have them all over the Muslim world. But Sinan, it's like, he is telling you the music of the spheres in triangles and squares and these different colors because colors have meaning also. This is beautiful. It's beautiful. So this is our science. And also another thing about Islam is that as you see in this Aqidah, it's very simple. It's very basic. We like to do things the simplest way. And in the European tradition they often do it the most difficult way. I could give you really good examples of that. And a lot of the knowledge that was transmitted from the Muslim world to the West, and almost everything was. Where did Westerners get humanism? Humanism, George Muktasi shows this in the rise of humanism. It's a pure academic study, a careful academic study. Humanism comes out of the circle of the Udaba and the Kutab, especially the chancelleries. The, the kutab who write for the kings and the princes and so forth. This is where humanism comes from. You know, which is the most European, the most Western of all their values. And where did they get the PhD? Where did they get the dissertation? Where did they get freedom of uh, research? They got it from the madrasa. Not the madrasas that you have today where the little kids are sitting there, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and Memra. No, the madrasa that was a university madrasa. That had a waqf with a big library and that produced a faqih and a mujtahid and a mufti. And the PhD degree comes from the authorization of the mufti, faqih and mujtahid. And he has to have a thesis and he has to defend it. He has to know ilm al khilaf. And he has to take a position and defend it. This is the way our madrasas work. And this is what produces the Western University. Again, George Makhdisi, who's a Christian Arab. The Rise of Colleges. These are two great books. The Rise of Colleges and the Rise of Humanism by George Makhdisi. I like George Makhdisi very much. You know, I really do. He was a, I think he was a great man. George Makhdisi. You know, and... and uh, you know, so we have a huge influence on the West in all their sciences, their mathematics. You know, Abdullah al-Battani figures out the Copernican theory a long time before Copernicus. Thabit ibn Qurra works out the basis of calculus long before Newton and before Leibniz. Uh, uh, Newton and, I think Leibniz, right? Who was the other person who did calculus? Wasn't it Leibniz? I think it was. Okay, I mean really, but usually we did things really simply. We did things really easily. In our architecture, everything. This is the gift of Islam, to keep things easy. Um, you know, look at Al Hamra, for example, in Granada, if you've ever been there. I go to Granada every summer. You know, beautiful place, beautiful place. But Al Hamra is just mud. It is so basic, but it is so majestic. 
And it's because of the simplicity in it. This is the nature of our culture. And really, this is what you have to do today. We have to revive this tradition. This is what gave us life. This is what gave us these beautiful mosques. This is what gave us the beautiful houses. When the French came to Egypt in the days of Napoleon, who had the superior way of life? The French or the Egyptians? No questions. Egyptians. The Egyptian peasant had a standard of living that was vastly superior to every French soldier. You know, and Cairo was a beautiful city. Cairo was one of the wonders of the world, as was Fez, as was Meknes, as were most Muslim cities. Beautiful cities, spectacular cities, houses. You know, I was in the house of Abdul Aziz al Dubar in Fez. You know, uh, I was a guest of his descendants. And the house, I couldn't believe it, it's so beautiful. An old Moroccan house. And even the, 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 the toilet, you know, where you go to the bathroom. I told my son, I said, you have to go. He said, I don't have to go to the bathroom. They said, no, but you, I want you to go to the restroom. I want you to see it. Because it was amazing the way they made it. It was totally traditional, you know. I mean, Muslims made beautiful things. Beautiful things and very simple things. In Spain, they made water clocks. And they're very simple in their basic engineering. You know, that ability to think simply, E equals MC squared. You know, energy is mass times the speed of light squared. That's simplicity. That's simplicity. You know, and we have that gift to do that. And we are the people who root knowledge. You know, uh, whatever the Islamic tradition is, and I believe in the Islamic tradition. But one of the things about the Islamic tradition is that a man or woman who is intelligent, like many of you, and who has a long life, may Allah give us all long lives and good health, and who has adequate leisure, they can master the whole tradition in a lifetime. Everything. And I've seen scholars like that, like Shadali and Nafer of Tunisia. I love Shadali and Nafer. And I visited him for the first time in 1978, 1979. And you know, he was a great scholar. But Tunisian scholars are beautiful. Egyptian scholars are beautiful. But Tunisian scholars are really... And Al-Andalus, Muslim Spain, is the light of Tunisia. You know, Tunisia made Al-Andalus. Al-Andalus made Morocco. Okay. But the, in Shadri and Nefer, you know, his house was a beautiful Tunisian house. And he had books and manuscripts everywhere. And in my experience with the Shadri and Nefer, he knew everything in his books. I was amazed by him. He knew medicine. He knew geography. He knew history. He knew the Quran. He knew everything. And it's like, he even took me into his kitchen. He said, even in the kitchen we have books. And he did. He had all books in the kitchen as well. But it's like Shadri and Nefer is able to master the whole tradition in his lifetime. How? How is that possible? And there, I've known other scholars like that. How? Rooting knowledge. Rooting knowledge. We root the knowledge, just like a book like the Ajurumiya. Very simple text, very blessed, but it roots grammar and syntax. And it enables you to read Siba Way. It enables you to read uh, the, the other great people and to get it all because it puts down the basic principles of these things in the modern age we have to do that you know we have got to teach chemistry we've got to teach physics we've got to work with quantum quantum mechanics we've got to teach sociology and anthropology and we have to give it a common language and enable and make it something that all of us can master and we can do this is our tradition and what's happening in the West is that it becomes more and more atomized. The more you learn, the less you know. Whereas for us, the more we learn, the more we know. But this is the secret of ta'seen al-ulum, of rooting knowledge. And that's the great, one of the greatest secrets of Islamic civilization. And of course it begins with theology. This is the rooting of knowledge. What is the foundation of reality? And again, this basic theology, which is the first obligation, the first wajib, it's just the foundation. On it you build a palace. 
And that palace has in it physics and metaphysics, has in it chemistry, it has in it history, real history. And again, if we open that door, we won't even go home tonight, because that's what I really love, is history. You know, the history of the world is your history. What we did, humanism, universities, the PhD, the professor's chair, all of that. You know, and Muslims, you cannot understand the history of Europe, not Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, Northern Europe, not even the Vikings, if you don't know what we were doing. You know, I mean, so we've got a lot to do, and, and you are a beautiful generation. You know, you are a beautiful generation.